namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suchedoye olahudi samyao sanputoshe. Namo sadanto suchedoye olahudi samyao sanputoshe. Wushang shen shen wei miao fa. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Shifu Shangren, Goe Shishung, Venerable Master, Dharma friends, Good evening to you, good afternoon to you. Today is Sunday, November 7th here in the Gold Coast of Queensland, Australia. And it is Saturday night, November 6th, my sister Liz's birthday, I might add, good Scorpio sister, uh, in California and Northern Hemisphere. So we have gathered together to look into the Flower Garland Sutra, the Avatamsaka Sutra, and the passage uh, for tonight and for next week, and I'm assuming we'll get through that passage, is among the most beautiful, most mm, poetic, not poetic, inspiring. Uh, it's not poetry, it's prose, and the imagery is compelling. Um, it's one of the, the most memorable and stirring, not just the word, it's a stirring passage of the entire first stage of the Avatamsaka's 10 stages chapter. So I'm really, you say pumped, is that the word? I'm excited, I'm thrilled to be able to share it with you all. Um, before we begin the text tonight, I wanted to um, share with everyone something that I, I believe, as long as I'm here, I'm going to make it part of my process in the, the uh, you know, we have the Dharma request, then we have my invocation to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Flower Garland Assembly, inviting them to come and to attend and shed light and chase our blues and purge our offenses and shatter the darkness with their brilliant light of wisdom. That's what we're about to do, but I'm going to add a piece to it, which is acknowledgement of country. And uh, this last Thursday, we were over at the Baha'i Center for our interfaith gathering. And every month when our interfaith group, the, the multi-faith action and advisory group here on the Gold Coast, every time we meet, the first thing that happens is we acknowledge country, uh, as that's how they call it, Acknowledgement to country, acknowledgement of country, acknowledgement. Yeah. Uh, country is a, a very rich, pregnant word in Australia because it refers to the earliest human inhabitants of this continent and their relationship to the land. And so, wherever we are every month in our uh, interfaith travels, and we've, we've been here at Gold Coast Dharma Realm mm, four or five times. Um, whoever is uh, in charge of the gathering um, takes responsibility for the acknowledgement to country. And this time at the, at the Baha'i Center, uh, Kay Chiswell, one of our wise women uh, in the group, read this acknowledgement and I think it is a very graceful, very elegant, and uh, proper, graceful thing to begin every public meeting with. And I asked uh, some friends about it, and they said it's not a law, um, it is a, a new custom that began in Australia not that long ago. 
uh, but it was just, it was adopted nationwide because of acknowledgement of uh, humility that the white people, the non-indigenous, were not the first humans on this land. And that acknowledgement is a very Buddhist uh, way to open your heart and to place yourself into the flow of all life forms. Kind of like Indra's net. You know how Indra's net, the idea is in front of Chakra Devanam Indra's palace up in the heavens. Uh, there's a net, which is just an adornment, decoration. And it's a net of pearls, they say, that are perfectly round and transparent, but also reflecting. So there's an outside to them, and you can also see through them. And each and every single pearl stitched into Indra's net reflects all the other pearls, and the entirety of the net is gathered back by each individual pearl. So there's this heartbeat function where you look at one, you see them all, and each one gathers them all back, and you see everything, and it comes back. So Indra's net is it's a very um, evocative image. People who know nothing more about Buddhism like Indra's net as an image and use it. Uh, and it is indeed an avatamsic estate. So to see my life as a human being uh, reflective of every other human being who's ever lived, but at the same time, um, I am one out of the many, 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 many hundred billion people who've ever lived. Uh, 100 million people? Uh, 100 billion people. So, um, more on that later. So anyway, to be able to say this at the beginning of lectures from Australia, and I think the American, uh, <laughs> we Americans could do very well with adopting this humility and making it something that we do Every time there's a public gathering, this is a custom for every um, governmental meeting, whenever people gather together to do the business of the state, um, they acknowledge country, um, social organizations can choose to do it, and we as a religious organization, I think it's very helpful to say as we start, the Kombumeri people of the Ugambe language group practice their spiritual connections to land and to all creation in this location for thousands of years. And today we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians. With gratitude that we share this land today, with sorrow for the cost of that sharing, and with hope that we can move to a place of justice and partnership together, we acknowledge their wisdom and their elders past, present, and emerging. And to be able to say that Buddhism actually can make a contribution uh, as we uh, explore our wisdom and share our compassion with the wisdom and elders past, present, and emerging. Maybe so. Okay, so I think that's a, I'm really happy to be able to offer that to our wider Buddhist community and say that if uh, in the U.S. we just don't wait for it to become, don't wait for it to be top down. I believe it was Kevin Rudd as prime minister was the first one to, yeah, who speaks good Mandarin, by the way, uh, past prime minister. He was the one who ushered that in. And I think in the U.S. we could benefit by adding something similar. So let us now invoke spiritual presence. Here's, we'll come back to page 58 when we're done. Here it is. Expand it a bit. Okay, there we go. Faithful trusty banjo. Here's our note.
more from the banjo later. Alrighty, back to page 58. And people will recall, if you've been following, that um, slide back down here, 58, there we go. People will recall our bodhisattva here on the, yeah, exactly there. Our bodhisattva has, is on the first stage out of 10, and he or she is training. And we're reviewing it again to have a second look because this, uh, it's a rich mine. There's lots of gold and gems and valuables here to, to mine and to enrich ourselves with. So, the first stage is about vows. That's what it's about. The Bodhisattva is setting up his or her foundation for the, the road ahead. And vows are the thing that tell us the direction we're going. Practices are the nitty gritty of doing it. But the vows say, this is, this is the course. We're going that way. And the Bodhisattva has just made 10 vows which are long, they're, they're not like quit smoking, you know, give up cheese or something. It was like, I'm going to uh, never turn my back on living beings. And although I'm interested in the Buddha's stillness and serenity of nirvana, at the same time, living beings' sufferings are th something that I have to attend to. I can't stop teaching. Vows like that, you know, vows to constantly turn the Dharma wheel. After the 10 vows were made, the thing we saw last time was 10 propositions of infinity. It was like, never stop, never stop. And we actually had a tune uh, to the ends of the Dharma realm, to the realm, the ends of, to the, throughout the Dharma realm, to the ends of empty space, throughout all future time, to the ends of future eons, without cease, without cease. That's how, that's the refrain that followed every vow. So then 10 propositions of infinity to say, if, you know, if the, the sun doesn't rise in the morning, my vows will stop, but the sun is never gonna not rise, so my vows will never stop, just like the sun will always rise. In fact, if you think about it, the sun doesn't rise, we turn into it, our planet turns. So if our planet ever stops turning, my vows will end. But as the vow says, <coughs> don't hold your breath. <coughs> Thunderous sneezes. If I had my other microphone, I could go pop, hit the sneeze button. But this mic doesn't have a sneeze button. So that's what we, that's what we had. After saying, I'm going to do these things forever and forever, something happens. What happens? Ready? Ro-ran-xin, 
、寂静心、调伏心、寂灭心、迁下心、轮子心、不重心、不着心。Go. Disciples of the Buddha, once bodhisattvas have. Sorry, one more time. There we go. Once bodhisattvas have made such great vows, they then attain a beneficent mind, a compliant mind, an accordant mind, a serene mind, a subdued mind of nirvana, a humble mind, a moistened mind, an unmoving mind, and a mind free of turbidity. Going on. Ten kinds of minds. Now, these minds, just a moment here. Notes to the first ground, notes to. Let's check here, see if this is what I've got. Nope, not that.、Um, notes to the first ground. Sunday, hold on. I'm looking for. Jonan Shan. No. 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 First grand letters. Okay. There we are. I want you to see what a shin looks like. Shin looks like this. Boom. And, gotta make it bigger. Make it really big. Have a big heart. There it is. Shin and it's read as Shin first tone, kind of like Shin on your leg, but between your knee and your ankle, like that. Shin, right, first tone.、Um, you'll notice it's a picture of the actual heart organ. The This is one of the,、mm, some people say 13%, some people say 11% of the <clears throat> available Chinese characters that actually are pictograms. This is a picture. Not all Chinese idioms are pictures, some of them are phonetic. They come for the sound, so they go to the ear, not the eye. This is one of the ones that goes to the eye. Xin, it's an actual picture of. The heart organ, physical organ in your body, with、uh, the veins and the arteries intact. It changed over the years, but you can readily see the pump there. And on one hand, Xin does refer to that. If you have,、uh, you know, Xin Zhang Bing, you have a heart attack.、Um, what is the Xin? The Xin is a pump. The mind, the heart, the heart is a pump. Which moves blood around so that it can carry oxygen, goes to the lungs, goes to the liver, goes to the kidneys, goes to the spleen, goes to the gallbladder, goes to the heart. And we are, our bodies are sustained, physical bodies are sustained by this pump. But it's important to note that it's not. Just a pump. The heart is an electrical organ. It contains a, a pacemaker that goes bump, 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 and fires. So the heart is considered to be the、uh, the seat of the fire element in the body. Where does that element begin? Maybe the sun. Maybe our heart is a little piece of the sun, but It shoots out an electrical impulse、uh, in perfect rhythm.、Uh, if you go jogging, it'll speed up. When we're asleep, it slows down. But it knows exactly when to fire. So it's got both this pulling the old blood in, sending the new blood out so it can oxygenate and with the, you know like that. But it also Shoots off this impulse regularly, perfectly in time. So much so, how important is that? If it's out of rhythm, we have things called arrhythmia, right? We have,、uh, and then you get in a pacemaker. We have learned how to 
refire the heart in case it goes wrong. So it's that second function, the, the fire bringer, the electrical beat of the heart that moves to the second function of this word in Chinese, xin, which is mind. And it's here that our sutra talks about 10 kinds of minds. 10 kinds of what? Um, it can be the individual thought, which is the product of the mind, but it's more amorphous. It's attitude. It's mindset. We, back in Berkeley years ago, when we were first working with the, the 10 stages chapter, we spent 40 minutes of the lecture talking about the options for translation for Xin. Is it gestalt? Is it attitude? Is it mind? Should we just use the word mind and let people struggle with it? There, were, there was a faction that wanted to say heart. It's the 10 hearts of the Bodhisattva, just using the metaphorical, the figurative idea that you want to engage feeling, the feeling aspect, and mind didn't do that. Mind sounded cold, you know, cerebral, intellectual. When the bodhisattvas, xin is much more feeling. So you can see the challenge here. How do you translate this? And I think we've, we've settled on mindset. So mindset as a word. And did we hyphenate it? Do we probably better to hyphenate it? So what's a mindset? Uh, it's a way of looking, a way of feeling. It's a state of being. Um, the one that people wanted was that, that we tried for a while and gave up was state of mind. Because state of mind, again, sounded almost clinical, like you could take medicine to cure it, you know. State of mind is like deranged state of mind or upset state of mind. Something like it, it sounded too much like a, uh, a problem that you needed to cure. So mindset we liked because it, there's a voluntary part of it. It sounds like you can control it. It sounds like it's a choice that you make. And the, with that in mind, it lends itself to cultivation. Why? Because through practice, you can reset your mind. What's the value there? Suppose you're depressed. You, that suggests that it's a temporary mindset. Depression is not innate. Depression is not fated. Depression is not permanent. Depression is not in charge. It's not the boss of you. So those, those are, that's a nice aspect to mindset. Reset your mind. Cultivate your mind. Right? You can, um, if you've been bad, you can change. That's probably the most appealing aspect of the translation of mindset. So we settled for mindset with that. Um, did that make it into our Bodhisattva's ten hearts? Not quite. But let's take a look here. Having made the vows the Bodhisattva made and then made them into infinity, meaning it's going to go on and on, they're not just a New Year's resolution that you're going to forget by February. They are changes in attitude that must follow those vows. You make the vow, I'm going to do this. What happens is your mind changes. Your attitude changes. Your mind resets. Following that come the practices that make the vows work. And those practices rely on the attitudes. Okay, what is this? You're looking at 
a Tang Dynasty, 1,400-year-old commentary from Master Chengguan. Let me show that to the translators, our happy translators who work so hard. Here it is. Uh, okay, just a second here, Cliff. Uh, let's see here. Xin. Okay, there we are. Oh, you're looking, this is a Tang Dynasty commentary. Isn't that cool? I don't know, maybe you don't think so. I think it's cool <laughs> to have uh, someone's shoulder to look over. We can look over the shoulder of Master Chengguan, who was known as Avatamsaka Bodhisattva, among other things. Uh, someone who knew whereof he wrote, he understood the Avatamsaka, and he looks at this and he explains it for us. So, um, because you first made these huge bows, they perfumed your mind. They directed your mind. The zi de li yi dang shi xin. After that, ten mindsets arose. You got ten reactions to these great bows that perfumed your mind. And wei qi, wei qi, heng yi. These are the attitudes that now your practices will rely upon. Are you going to meditate? Are you going to recite the Buddha's name? Are you going to give up bad habits? Are you going to stop scolding your spouse, your partner, your kids? Uh, if so, those are the practices that arise from having new mindset. You reset your mind, these are the practices that will follow. And then there are ten practices that follow that, which will uh, make you free, which will set you free. You will be free in those practices because they're relying on the new attitudes. Ranyo R E E E Shin So um, the ten mindsets are what the ten practices rely upon. Okay? So just to say, what's that about? Here they are. Here are those ten that are back. I redid them for you out of my notes page. Um, so that we can take a look and say, suppose I was interested in doing what a first stage bodhisattva did, what would happen if I did that? What would happen to me? How would I change? What would be new in my life if I said, yes, I'm going to make these vows. Yes, I'm going to follow these practices. I'm going to, because I admire bodhisattvas, I'm going to, imitate him. One is, the first thing that happens is, let's see, having, let's see, the Bodhisattva makes great vows like those and gets Ten mind resets, <laughs> mindsets. So it's not a mindset, it's a mind reset. One is a benefit, xin. There, see this word ten times? A benefit, xin, a benefit, mind reset. Benefiting, a benefiting, mind reset. What does it mean? The bodhisattva wants to help. That's the first thing. Why? Going back, show you. Here it is. Why does he want to do that? It's because right here. Li yi xinzhe, li yi baku, qi shi bei so yi. Hold on. Capture that one. There's our text. Okay. Oh, I already did it. Right there. Yeah, that's it. Um, 
Make it bigger and read it. Tang Dynasty speaking to you. This is like 800. Okay. Number one, why does the Bodhisattva have a helping mind reset, a wish to benefit others? Li yi baku. Why? Because helping ends pain. Helping pulls out suffering, literally. If you can help others, so here's the Bodhisattva. He's going to set foot on the Bodhisattva path and start out on this huge long journey. Why? Because he has a mindset that wants to help because he knows if he helps others, they will stop hurting. He wants to help them stop hurting. This is what compassion depends on. There it is. That is compassion mind which relies upon. So, where does great compassion come from? It comes from a wish to help. You see somebody in pain, you want to stop it. You want to help them with it. Furthermore, it says, it, it cures, it remedies, what? Sun Hai Zhang, the obstacle of harming. Sun Hai is to harm. Nang Cheng Bei Hung. And it helps you succeed in your practices of compassion. So, okay, that's Tang Dynasty language from another commentator. So what does it mean? Put that away for now. What that means is, if in your daily rounds, all you have to do is turn on the news, not recommending, that, that's stiff, stiff. <laughs> takes, takes a stern constitution to be able to turn on the news and not be overwhelmed. We can have what's called compassion fatigue. But let's say you turn the news off and you step out in your garden. And I have been dealing with stressed birds birds who are stressed. I talked about it last week. Who are the stressed birds? At the moment, it's currawongs. They're parents. Ben met them today. Two large black birds, yellow eyes, big beak. They look kind of like crows, but not really. They're not in the corvid family. They're related to magpies, um, butcher birds. They're stressed because they have babies in the nest that are bottomless and hungry. They're, these babies are as large as the parents. It's amazing how quickly Kurawang babies match their parents in size. They fill the nest. They actually, the nest can't hold them. I found a dead Kurawang baby chick under the nest last week, had been pushed out. Uh, they're just too big. The nest is not large enough. And these babies are always, always hungry. And so the parents, I, I don't know, what would they do without me, Dan? I'm just, I don't know. <laughs> just the answer is just fine, thank you. <laughs> that, that's a big mistake to think that somehow I'm significant in the lives of these birds. But they have found me to be a soft touch. So every time my face shows up, at my front door, and I step out on my deck, on my balcony, the Kurawang parents are there going, and they make this pitiful sound, like that. And I go, okay, okay. Go in, chop up an apple, little pieces, put out a saltine cracker, scrape the salt off it, put it down, little bits, so they can gobble it down, and they don't eat it themselves. They fly off to the nest, cough it back up to the babies, the babies go, as soon as they swallow, they're hungry again. And the parents come flying right back for more. Right? So you can see the stress levels in these birds. Who would think birds would be able to deal with stress? They do. What, what are you going to do? You're the father. You're the mother. These are your babies. You're responsible. Stressed birds. And I, I kind of hide out. I put, turn the light off and pull the curtain so they don't know I'm there because if they know I'm there and my, I have a bike 
and the bike handlebar is right under my window. And I walk by, and there are these yellow eyes in the window looking at me like this, you know, looking through the window. Like, whoa. Okay, okay, I'll come out and feed you so you can ease the pains of hunger of your babies. Ah. So if you just turn the news off and go out and get the real news happening in your neighborhood, you'll see that everybody's hungry. Everybody wants shelter, safety. We want to be safe. We want to be fed. We want to be connected. That's primary suffering. And it's happening everywhere. The benefit of living, as you can see on my desktop, in the forest here in the bush, <coughs> is that the quality of suffering is not created by greed, anger, or delusion. It's, you'd say, just... The, the fundamental suffering that the Buddha mentioned. So the Buddha's naming of that suffering is very visible here in the bush. Birth, old age, sickness, death, rebirth. You can see it. They're right there. So the, those kinds of suffering are evident. The suffering of being apart from what you love. Um, occasionally the bird's partners will die early. And you can see the sadness of these birds that mate for life, suddenly having no partner. Uh, the suffering of being close to things you don't like. Uh, lorikeets, there you go. Uh, the uh, having to try to feed yourself when lorikeets are being bullies. Right? So the, the suffering of seeking and not getting is so obvious. Right? You're hungry and the food is not there. Ah. And then the seeking, the suffering of just having these five component parts of your personality that age, the suffering of, they call it the blaze of the skandhas, just aging and going bad and just inherent badness, you know. Um, so eight kinds of suffering the Buddha mentioned are just so evident right there. It has nothing to do with humanity's greed. It has to do with just being alive in a body. So, nature speaks the Dharma. That is to say, the Buddha articulated, uh, gave uh, systems that humans could understand, gave language to the patterns of nature that he discovered, that he observed. And sure enough, it is the case. Those eight sufferings are evident everywhere. So, I'm saying, just opening your ears to what's going on around me. When I open my ears to what goes on around me, I am moved in my heart by what I see and I want to do something about it. So, li yi nang baku, right? Benefiting others, helping others is a way to ba, pull out ku, suffering, to end pain. And you want to do it. Um, I'm a student of uh, music because I like to reset Chinese Buddhist musical traditions in Western modes. When that project moves forward even a little bit, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to contribute to that. And one of the best forms that I've found are blues music, is blues music. Uh, definitely a creation of American culture uh, because of African citizens being stolen, being kidnapped, and taken away on ships to another continent to serve as in slavery as a generator of economic wealth for the slave owners. The music that arose from that experience was took its form as called blues. So black slavery in the United States uh, was horrendous and horrific and is still an open festering wound in our national psyche. Um, but it gave birth in turn to a musical form that has touched the world. Because why? The blues is a way of 
baku, of pulling up suffering. It allows the pain of old age, sickness and death, and rebirth to come out and be shared in a musical form. I'm a student of that because it's a wonderful setting for Buddhist music, uh, Dharma blues, right? Buddhist blues. The Buddha said, Kua, Kua. All things that come together and made up of parts, when they fall apart, it hurts. Your body is one of those things. The planet is one of those things. That's the Buddha's observation that all conditioned things will come apart. All things that are made of conditions have an end. And to the degree that we attach to them, that's how much we hurt. So thank you, Buddha, for saying the way things are, that's just how it is. And then setting to work to find a way to cope, to deal with that, to make sense of it, and then ultimately to understand it so thoroughly that you can put an end to the painful part. Put an end, the pain doesn't end, the suffering behind the pain is optional. So by understanding it, and then by finding something inside us that doesn't come apart, that's the Buddha's discovery. And that was, of course, the experience of nirvana. Let's look at those hearts. Take a look, coming up, what were they? It's another way to end suffering. Here we go, right there. They were not only benefiting, but soft and pliant. Hard and edgy? Uh-uh. Hard and demanding? Nope. So you shouldn't. Harmonious. Following and flowing. Heart. The Bodhisattva makes the vows and then says, yeah, I'm going to follow along. Give me a situation. I will find a way to mold myself to it. Another one? Tranquil. Qi Jing. Right? An attitude, a mindset that is tranquil, that is not upset. Find a way to keep your tranquility intact. Taofu, uh, a mindset that is tuned. Taofu, tuned. We, that, you could translate that as tamed. Mm, yeah, that has, I mean, there's some resonance there. You tame it, but you tune it. The, the tiao, it's very much like an instrument string. Too, too tight, to un untune it. Too loose, blah, tune it up till it gets mm, perfect, right? That's that month that the Bodhisattva wants. Look at this one. Here we go. The stopped mind. What are other choices here? It, we used to call this uh, ceased or cessation. We used to call it still and extinct. That was an old translation, an extinct mind. Uh-uh, it's not an extinct mind. It's very much still going, but it has stopped. Contemplate that one. Bodhisattva's mind says, enough. Just stop. And of course it doesn't, but even that brief pause from the madness going on, healing. That's a mind, you reset your mind. Okay, Tian Xiao, humble. Not big or biggest or bigger than you, right? It is a humble mind. Doesn't seek to be big. Wants instead to find its place in the net. Just one more pearl, because if you can really be one pearl, you hold the whole thing. It's when we think we're different and special that we fall off the net. We're nothing. Then look at this one, moistened. I like that. Uh, we have been having lots of rain. California has been having some rain. Uh, unseasonal and uh, often flooding rain, but ground that did not bear anything green 
once it's moistened, whoop, up comes the sprouts. That's the mind. And then budong, stable is I think a really good translation. It's, you could also call it unmoving, but stable, a stable mind. Doesn't, sh doesn't shift, doesn't wiggle, doesn't like that, right? And then the last one is udro, not turbid, uh, yeah, but we have a positive expression of that, pristine, a pristine mindset, an immaculate mindset. Remember Carlos Castaneda, the teachings of Don Juan, the Yaqui way of knowledge. Um, Carlos, the anthropologist, kind of reclaimed uh, the word immaculate for us. He said the warrior's heart is immaculate. Uh, no thinking. You got a Zen bow with an arrow at full draw. You know, as soon as your mind moves, boom, oh, too bad. You had a fall, boom, arrow goes off, right? Your mind is immaculate, pristine, just you and the target are not two, but one. So immaculate, that's the warrior's mind. And further, um, the, uh, I, this, this next bit of text here comes also from the commentary, Master Chungguan's commentary. But what he said was, put you away for now, there we go. What he said was, each of those 10 hearts uh, remedies something. They are the antidote for something. Okay, let's take a deep breath here. How about <laughs> digest that? future time throughout all numbers of eons without cease without cease without cease so the bodhisattva has made those vows and after that mind sets happened and that list was It was a revelation for me because when, before I really met Buddhism, all I knew was Zazen. I knew how to sit still, kinda. I certainly, I could still my body, but I didn't have a clue about my mind. It just rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled. And my mind was something I fought with, struggled with beat back, reacted against, got angry with, frustrated with, almost gave up because it wouldn't be quiet. My mind wouldn't be quiet. And this is, uh, you know, Dogen Zenji, bless his heart, uh, who is the formulator of the Soto brand of Zazen, Buddhist meditation, Japanese Zen meditation, as carried through the Eheiji line in the Soto school, he was really good at getting us set up on our seat. 
Shikantaza, Shiguan Datsu, only pay attention to your sitting. He said. And the word practice became this huge word. My practice, my practice. So we just break our zafu sitting there. We sit until our zafu breaks. But from a mainstream school of Soto Zen in Japan, I didn't understand how to step into, how to ru, that word in Chinese, to engage with my mind, to actually get in and work with the spinning, wheeling, ceaseless, anxious, grasping, craving, insatiable thoughts in my mind. When the Bodhisattva wants to do what Bodhisattvas do, look at where he goes. This is what happens when you set foot on the Bodhisattva path. You get to help people. Your mind gets soft. You become harmonious. You become tranquil. You adjust. You stop. You get humble. You moisten. You, you stop moving. You purify mind. Ah, <laughs> thank you, Buddha. Relief, relief, because why? It goes to where the pain is happening. It goes right to the itch and scratches. That's what was wrong. I couldn't sit still long enough because the shikantaza under, no, Mind you, I'm, I'm selling Dogen short. Dogen, in fact, was uh, Dao Yuan Chan Shi, his name in Chinese, right? Dogen Zenji, Japanese. His Shobo Genzo Sui Monkey, the, the Zhang Fa Yan Zhang, uh, his, his text does indeed talk to the mind because Dogen was, was uh, an accomplished Zen master and went deeper. But the challenge is getting to the heart of it and then expressing it. For that job, go to the Buddha. That was Master Hua's, uh, one of his many great gifts to us was him saying, let the Buddha's voice be heard. Ask the Buddha, you will get an answer. Um, we, we had a conversation earlier today about the, what, uh, how Buddhism is coming to the West and there have been few people who walked in the very wide open front door of the Mahayana tradition. Han Chuan Fu Zhao, the, the, the Mahayana school, Mahayana approach in the Bodhisattva path is little explored, rarely explored. There are every kind of like every decade, there's another, I don't want to say, to say attack. There's another reason why people don't explore the Mahayana. In the past, there have been uh, Japanese voices from the Kyoto School of Scholarship that says it's been done. It's been thoroughly explored. There's nothing left to know there. Besides, it all comes down to Zen, and Zen becomes a koan, you know. What is the sound of one hand clapping? So it's ridiculous. Ignore it. Go to the Tibetan tradition. <laughs> so people do that. They just look right past the Mahayana, never having stepped into the Buddha's door. Because why? If you don't open the sutras, you don't know what he said. So you discard the whole thing and look elsewhere. Well, that's happened. Master Hua said, wait. Find out first what the Buddha said before you discard it. Let's not go to the commentaries, which is what the Chinese themselves did, thinking that the Buddha's sutras were not understandable, too full of Sanskrit, too old, you couldn't read it in the first place, too full of philosophy that was irrelevant to their lives. 
The Chinese didn't go in the door either. Master Hua said, open it up, be respectful. Namo da fang guang fu hua yan jing hua yan hai wei fu pu sa. Ask for help, ask for guidance, and with a compliant, moistened, humble, non turbid mind, look into it. See if it talks to you. And lo and behold, this thing opens up. There's another, uh, there's another attitude currently present that says, oh, Mahayana, that's corruption. Corruption, the only Dharma worth investigating for reliability is ancient Buddhism, primary Buddhism. What's, what's the word they use? They call it uh, original Buddhism, right? Again, didn't go through the door, didn't even ask discarding the entirety of the Mahayana Sutras, which are vast. Prajna, Prajna Paramita. Prajna Paramita is the repository of transcendent wisdom. If you've ever sat still to the point where your six senses turn around, suddenly Prajna Paramita opens and you realize there's another entire world of knowledge waiting in where? In the Dharma realm, where principles abide. And where is that? In the mind. The mind ground opens up and this garden of wisdom and compassion is there. The Bodhisattva path is waiting. But if you don't sit still, and you're only pleasing your senses, jumping around, uh, somehow Prajna Paramita is a corruption. <laughs> it's like, nope, only answer, get out. Leave the three realms behind. Save yourself. But nobody's done that since the Buddha, and so let's just be mindful. Right? So anyway, my point is to say, here's Master Hua saying, let the Buddha's voice be heard. Open the sutras. They will reward your effort. The Buddha's voice, the Buddha speaks English, the Buddha speaks Vietnamese, the Buddha speaks Chinese, the Buddha speaks French and Polish and Norwegian, and uh, the Buddha speaks Korean and Japanese and Cantonese and Fukienese and Australian English, right? Midwestern English. The Buddha speaks with the Midwestern accent. Furthermore, the Buddha speaks bird, and the Buddha speaks horse and ghost and deva. The Buddha can pantomime. But if you don't open your mind and use respect to investigate it, then it's just another one of those ancient religions that's probably irrelevant. And Let's all watch Netflix films, right? So, not recommend. <laughs> so, why do we bother? Why do we spend 90 minutes of every week digging into these ancient texts? It's because there's something incredibly inspiring about a human, a bodhisattva, who makes a great vow and as a result gets the thought, I want to help, a benefiting heart. That's the first thing that happens, the heart to benefit. Why? Because the benefiting heart can baku, can end pain for others. Why would you want to do that? Have you listened? Have you opened your ears? Have I opened my ears? Have I listened? Goodness gracious. Um, living in Calgary, uh, an old original neighborhood in Calgary, built around the railroad tracks. The neighborhood is called Ramsey, and it's, it's one of the earliest neighborhoods. Calgary was at a crossroads of the Trans-Canada Highway and the road that went north to Edmonton. Um, so cattle came through. Calgary is on the plains. And if you keep on going west, you meet the mountains when you get to British Columbia. But uh, a 
our first monastery in Calgary was in Ramsey, and just across the railroad tracks was the old slaughterhouse called Abattoir, right? Tu Zaichang. And the cattle would come in on train cars on these uh, cars, you know, freight cars for the railroad that were specially designed to hold cattle. And as the trains came in, you could hear the sounds of the cows being unloaded. And I believe there were also pigs, but it was mostly beef. The Calgary is the home of the famous Calgary Stampede, which is one of Canada's, if not one of the world's biggest rodeos. Calgary Stampede, oh my, what a, what a do, what a show, based on killing of cows for beef, for tallow, for hides, all the things that you make out of the bodies of a large sentient animal. The, when we were there, the trains came in at night. They wouldn't come in during the day because maybe we had the feeling that the, uh, the deeds didn't meet the light of the sun. They knew that they had to be hidden away under the cover of darkness, maybe, probably not, because killing cows is a big deal in Calgary, still is. So, um, sunset, dark, do our morning, evening chanting, morning, our, our, our wanka, evening ceremonies over, meditating, you would hear the train in distance, and the trains would pull up just within hearing distance of the monastery where we were, and this was an old uh, mom and pop grocery store converted to a monastery because that's what the lay people could afford when they wanted to invite us to set up a temple, a monastery in Calgary. So you'd hear the train stop, steam engine, electric engine, coal fired, stop. And there would be a, an energy that would just come in through the windows, through the air of desperation. And you would hear the sounds of these, you know, half a ton, 1,200 pound, 1,400 pound sentient animal with a brain larger than ours, a heart larger than ours, but a nervous system that can feel pain and has emotion identical to ours as the animals would be herded off the boxcars and they could feel the energy of the slaughterhouse that waited them, awaited them, and we could feel their fear and their desperation and the sound as the cows disembarked, heading for their death and their butchering. And I have to tell you, I can hear it in my ear today Chen Bai Nian Lai Wan Li Gong. Let's see if I can find that poem. So let's see, Chen Bai. So I don't, I can, re I want the, uh, there it is. I want the Chen Bai Nian. I want the translation, because uh, we translated it well. Chen Bai Nian Wan Li Gong. La 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 la. Yan Sheng Su Hai Han Nan Ping. There it is. Let's see if I can, if that's got an English. No, that's Master Hua's commentary. Let's see here. Okay, I'll have to do it from memory. So the poem goes like this Chen Bai Nian Lai Wan Li Gong, Yan Sheng Su Hai Han Nan Ping. Yu Zhi Shi Shang Dao Bing Chie, Chie Wen Tu Ban. Yeman Shang Cheban Yeman Cheban Chung Ye Tu Man Shang. Okay. For countless years the bitter stew of hate goes boiling on. The waves of hate are ocean deep, 
impossible to calm. To learn the sound, to learn the cause of wars and terror, killing, hate, and to, to learn the cause of all this terror, hate and bombs and war, listen to the haunting cries at midnight by the butcher's door. Okay. For, a thousand year, for, for thousands of years, the bitter stew of hate goes boiling on. Its waves of grief are ocean deep, impossible to calm. To learn the cause of all this misery, terror, bombs, and war, hear the haunting midnight cries by the butcher's door. There we go. I got, got the meter. So the idea is um, that this is a Chan master uh, called Cloud of Vows, Yuan, Yuan Yun Fa Shi. Cloud of Vows, Yuan Yun Fa Shi. He's a Tang Dynasty Chan master who looked at the suffering in the world, including terror, including armaments, arms race, and then warfare. And he said, the cause of the worst things that humans do, warfare and all the suffering, has a cause in butchery of animals, he said. And there's a graphic that depicts that, that shows the, the butchers and the Calgary <laughs> abattoir, slaughter yard, slaughterhouse, cutting, uh, stunning the head of the cow, slicing its throat, pulling it up by the heels so the blood drains out, and then running it along the conveyor belt where men mostly, but also women, are waiting with their knives to cut it to pieces and send it out to, to grocery stores. So the killing of the animals causes the war among humans. That's the principle. And people can challenge that. They can say, well, I don't see a connection. How does that work? For countless years, the bitter stew of hate goes boiling on. It's that the resentment, you can hear it, you can feel it, even if you don't see it. The resentment built up in the body of an animal slaughtered uh, for its meat is palpable, it's real, it's strong, and it goes out into the world and it doesn't just dissipate. It's there and it builds up and it builds up and it builds up and every boxcar carried, what, a dozen cows maybe? And they all that, you multiply that by how many cars on the train, you multiply that by how many trains per night, you multiply that by how many nights in a year, and you have lots of hatred generated between heaven and earth that just at some point boils over. Um, I'm going to play, I decided to go ahead and do it, I'm going to play a video. And what's the point of this? The point is, the sutra said, after making vows, the bodhisattva has a wish to help. He has a new mindset, making those being inspired to be a bodhisattva, to set out on the path is the first stage out of 10, right? So that inspiration, the bodhisattva says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to become a teacher because I can really help. I can do something about the amount of suffering in the world that I see and hear with my own eyes and ears. I can do something about it, says the bodhisattva. So with that thought in mind comes the li yixin, this, this wish to benefit the wish to help. I want to help. And Master Chong Guan says, li yi nang baku. When you help others, you can pull up their suffering. Okay, now, the question is, woman zhi bu zhi ku, do we recognize suffering when we see it? Do we understand its cause? Do we know it can stop? And then do we have a way to make it stop? That's the Four Noble Truths in another expression. Here is a 10-minute video that I'm going to play that is 
strong, but it's helpful because it, it helps us jirku, that first step, recognize suffering when we see it, and ideally, hopefully, spark in us a wish to help. This is a talk given in 2012 by a man named Philip Woolen, uh, May 16, 2012. It was a debate, and the debate was under the topic, animals should be off the menu. Six speakers, three on either side, three of them proponents of the meat and dairy industry. Animals definitely should be on the menu. Three from the animal rights and uh, vegetarian vegan diet exponents. Philip Woolen's talk was so evocative and so powerful that since 2012 it has been uh, translated into 18 languages here. I'll, I'll put the Chinese uh, uh, subtitles on the screen if people want to watch. It's been circulated around the world and uh, carried on. We, we have actually uh, met with Philip and his wife Trix down in, in their home and invited him for a meal just to express our appreciation for his commitment and his obvious sincerity in uh, wanting to benefit beings to end their suffering. So, Philip Willen. What if you could generate a Philip, new income stream just by simply loading up some mini ebooks online on top? Okay. Now, just to tell you, Philip Woolen was a vice president of Citibank. He was a millionaire, and he quit uh, to found the uh, Kindness Trust. Uh, if you go to Facebook, you can find the Kindness Trust. I'll put that in the chat if uh, Jerry wants to send that on. Here we go chat right there okay kindness trust here is Philip Woolen he is now he and his wife have given their lives to uh, giving their money away to projects that benefit gives away a prize every year to individuals who have who carry on this work so let's take 10 minutes now I will uh, optimize the screen for the video clip let's listen to Philip Woolen talk about how benefit and others can end suffering Half of St James Ethics Centre, the Wheeler Centre, the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival, The Age, the City of Melbourne and the ABC, all of whom have worked together to make this event possible. I'd like to welcome Philip Woolen. King Lear, late at night on the cliffs, asks the blind Earl of Gloucester, how do you see the world? And the blind man Gloucester replies, I see it feelingly. And shouldn't we all? Animals must be off the menu because tonight they are screaming in terror in the slaughterhouses, in crates and in cages, vile, ignoble gulags of despair. You see, I heard the screams of my dying father as his body was ravaged by the cancer that killed him. And I realized I'd heard those screams before. In the slaughterhouse, their eyes stabbed out and their tendons slashed on the cattle ships to the Middle East and the dying mother wail as a harpoon explodes in her brain as she calls out to her calf. Their cries were the cries of my father. And I discovered that when we suffer, we suffer as equals. And in their capacity to suffer, a dog is a pig, is a bear, is a boy. Meat today is the new asbestos, more modorous than tobacco. CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide from the livestock industry are killing our oceans with acidic, hypoxic dead zones. 90% of small fish are ground up into pellets to feed to livestock. Vegetarian cows today are the world's largest ocean predators. The oceans are dying in our time. By 2048, all our fisheries will be dead, the lungs and the arteries of the earth. Billions of bouncy little chicks are ground up alive 
simply because they are male. Only 100 billion people have ever lived. Seven billion people live today. And yet we torture and kill two billion sentient living beings every week. 10,000 entire species are wiped out every year because of the actions of one. And we're now facing the sixth mass extinction in cosmological history. If any other organism did this, a biologist would call them a virus. It is a crime against humanity of unimaginable proportions. But happily, the world is changing. 10 years ago, Twitter was a bird sound. WWW was a stuck keyboard. Cloud was in the sky. 4G was a parking space. Google was a baby's burp. Skype was a typo. And Al Qaeda was my plumber. <laughs> Victor Hugo said, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Well, animal rights today is now the greatest social justice issue since the abolition of slavery. Do you know there are over 600 million vegetarians in this world? And that is bigger than the United States, England, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, all put together. If we were one nation, we would be bigger than the 27 nations of the European Union. Can you believe that? And despite this massive demographic footprint, we are still drowned out by the raucous hunt and shoot and kill and cartels who believe that violence is the answer when it should not even be a question. Meat kills animals, kills us, and is killing our economies. Medicare has already bankrupted the United States. They will need $8 trillion invested in Treasury bills just to pay the interest, and they have precisely zero. They could shut down every school, army, navy, air force, homeland security, marines, CIA, and FBI, and they still will not have the money to pay their doctor bills. And our Cornell and Harvard say that the optimum amount of meat in a healthy human diet is precisely zero. Water, as you know, is the new oil. Nations will soon be going to war for it. Underground aquifers that took millions of years to fill are now running dry. It takes 50,000 liters of precious drinking water to make one kilo of beef. Today, one billion people are hungry. 20 million people will die from malnutrition. Cutting meat by only 10% will feed 100 million people, and eliminating meat will end starvation forever. If everyone ate a Western diet, we would need two planet Earths to feed us. We've only got one, and she is dying. Greenhouse gas emissions from livestock is 50% greater than transport, as Peter said. Cars, trains, buses, ships, lorries, the whole lot. And as I travel around the world, I see poor countries who sell their grain to the West while their own children starve in their arms and the West feeds it to livestock, so we can eat a steak? Am I the only one who sees this as a crime? Believe me, every morsel of meat we eat is slapping the tear-stained face of a hungry child. When I look into her eyes, do I remain silent? The earth can produce enough food for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. We are facing the perfect storm. If any nation had developed weapons that could wreak such havoc on the planet, we would launch a preemptive military strike and bomb it back into the Bronze Age. But it's not a rogue state, it's an industry. The good news is we don't have to bomb it we can just stop buying it. Sir George Bush was wrong. The axis of evil does not run through Iraq, Iran, or North Korea. It runs through our dining tables. Weapons of mass destruction are our knives and forks. Our proposition is the Swiss Army knife of the future. It solves our environmental, water, human health problems, and ends cruelty forever. The Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. This cruel, disgusting industry will end because we run out of excuses. Meat is like the one and two cent coins. 
it costs more to make than it's worth. And I come from the bush. Farmers are the ones with the most to gain. Farming won't end, it would boom. Only the product line will change. Farmers would make so much money, they won't even bother counting it, and I'd be the first to applaud them. Governments would love us. New industries would emerge and flourish. Ins health insurance premiums would plummet. Hospital waiting lists would disappear. Hell, we'd be so healthy, we'd have to shoot someone just to start a cemetery. <laughs> so tonight I have two challenges for the opposition, two challenges. Meat causes a wide range of cancers and heart disease. Would they name one disease caused by a vegetarian diet? And two, I'm funding the Earthlings Trilogy. <clears throat> if the opposition is so sure of their ground, I challenge them to send a copy of the Earthlings DVD to all their colleagues and all their customers. Go on, I dare you. Animals are not just other species, they are other nations, and we murder them at our peril. The peace map is drawn on a menu. Peace is not just the absence of war, it is the presence of justice. Justice must be blind to race, color, religion, or species. If she's not blind, she will be a weapon of terror. And tonight, there is unimaginable terror in those ghastly Guantanamos we call factory farms or slaughterhouses. Believe me, if slaughterhouses had glass walls, we wouldn't be having this debate tonight. You see, I believe another world is possible. And on a quiet night, I can hear her breathing. Let's get animals off the menu and out of these torture chambers. Please vote tonight for those who have no voice. Thank you. Thunderous applause for Philip Woolen. Um, so, if anybody would like this, would like to watch that again, uh, I'll pop that into the chat box so that Jerry can uh, share it with YouTube friends. Here we go. There it is. Uh, yeah, for countless years, the bitter stew of hate that was boiling on its vengeful broth is ocean deep, impossible to calm. To learn the cause of all this hatred, terror, bombs, and war, hear the haunting midnight cries by the butcher's door. Yeah. I need to put that to music. We should, we should sing that one. Um, all right, Philip Olin, uh, bless his heart, a retired banker, uh, lives in, here in Australia. Um, the, uh, gives away his money now to people who um, use kindness to benefit others. So the Kindness House down in Sydney. Uh, or my, I believe it's in, Mel I think it's in Melbourne, actually. So, uh, there we go. And this is the business of the Bodhisattva who is interested in benefiting others and we only touched the uh, ten hearts tonight the ten mind resets that the bodhisattva that happened to him or her after making the vows that are going to guide him or her along the path of the bodhisattva so let me ask you is this philosophy how can people discredit and discard the avatamsaka sutra as being merely philosophy not my experience. This is heart-moving, um, fundamental, fundamentally human, truly human response to the world around us. It is pragmatic. It is action. 
based on actual human experience. I find this so relevant. I mean, Philip Woolen saying the effect on the um, economy of the United States and absolutely applies to Australia. In countries where obesity is now 40% of the adults, bodies are medically overweight, um, to take meat off the table and dairy, he doesn't say dairy, but you take dairy off the table, you, the, the money saved in our healthcare systems will be available to benefit our lives. Longevity would grow. Um, seniors' homes would empty themselves because we're discovering that a large part of Alzheimer's, a large part of the, uh, the decay of the brain that leads us into dementia and Alzheimer's is based on diet. Um, anyway, so you understand, this would radically transform our society and our relationships with ourselves, with our country, with our neighbors, or with our families in a way that would, would not require any other investment other than, as he says, uh, change the, the farmers don't have to change anything but the crop, change the product, take it away from large bonnied animals and put it back in vegetables. Starvation would disappear, he says. This is the work of compassion. And uh, I get so inspired by that collection of, of uh, truth bombs that is Philip Bullen's talk. So it's also, by the way, available um, in transcript form. If you go out looking for it, and you can download it. And I've done it here. I've got why animals should be off the menu. So there we are. All right. Next week, you know what happens next week? Uh, we go back an hour. We w this will be for folks here and folks in Asia. If you're watching in Taiwan, if you're watching in Malaysia, if you're watching in China, uh, wherever you're watching, we're going to be an hour later, starting at 1.30, not 12.30, because the U.S. goes into daylight savings tonight. You listeners in the U.S., set your clocks back tonight. Spring ahead, fall behind. Go back an hour. You get an extra hour of sleep. But what that does to us is we will be coming to you uh, an hour later next week. So keep that in mind. We will again be acknowledging country as we begin. And the Bodhisattva, something happens after those 10 mindsets. Faith happens. Faith. Amazing. We get to talk about faith next week, which is like, what? 10, uh, 11 kinds of faith arise, not 10. And uh, then the Bodhisattva looks at living beings and we get an unforgettable uh, indictment of what it's like to be a living being from the Bodhisattva, telling the truth again, how sad and pathetic we are. And then a reaction. So therefore, I've got to go cultivate the way. Huh, indeed. Well, the Avatamsaka is just incredibly powerful. This is the Buddha's voice. Um, go through this wide open door called the Mahayana. Uh, so, uh, let's see here. Are, is anybody there from Berkeley Monastery who would like to say a word? Do we have anybody online about events? I don't think so. I think they're traveling back from Snow Mountain. Our our community visited our master Hung Lai at Snow Mountain Monastery. I think they're still on the road. Okay, so what we will do then is we will finish tonight's lecture with a mantra um, called Edison Buddha's Mantra for Anointing the Crown of the Head. Homage to the Blessed Healer and Teacher, to the King of Jewel-like Radiance the one who is that way, the worthy, fully awakened one. Here's how we say it, to the healing, to the healing, to the healer, awakened 
Swaha. May all things be auspicious. Please make a wish. Send it out. As far as your mind can travel. Here we go. people can keep that running through your head during the week, uh, all the news about COVID-19, it gives you something to do. It's proactive. You can throw that mantra at vibrations in the world and the haunting midnight cries by the butcher's door decrease a little bit. Okay, uh, here's pictures of the Buddhas, city of 10,000 Buddhas. Can we make three vows? Please join me. Second bow. Third bow. We'll bow to Master Hua. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. We'll see you uh, an hour later if you are here in Asia or Australasia. We'll see you at 7.30 next week. Aumitofo. Bye-bye.